My name is Leonard Mermel. I'm an infectious diseases physician uh, here at Lifespan. My office is at Rhode Island Hospital. Um, my particular interest and passion is trying to prevent spread of infections in healthcare settings. And I've spent uh, uh, the last 30 years thinking about uh, how germs spread in various settings and how to reduce the risk of that spread. Um, I've worked with NASA, uh, the, the uh, National Academy of Sciences on infection prevention and control issues, and I'm happy to share some time with you today. Well, thank you for joining us uh, here at the Providence Journal and our audience. Let's start with how an individual in Rhode Island, or, or anywhere for that matter, should assess risk in terms of going out of the house or even in the house. Just sure. give us an overview of that. Sure. And I want to actually back up and, and, and let's first talk about, so uh, COVID is transmitted by a virus, a respiratory virus, a virus in our respiratory tract that's called SARS-CoV-2. And I think all of the readers of the journal and those listening to the podcast will have a better appreciation of how to reduce their risk if they understand how viruses like this are spread. Most of these viruses, and SARS-CoV-2, we believe is spread from something called respiratory droplets. When we breathe, we produce something called a bioaerosol. Coming out of our nose and our mouth are small particles, some very, very small, some larger ones that we call droplets. The small ones we call small particle aerosol. When we breathe, we produce these. When we talk, we produce more. When we talk loudly, we produce even more, or yelling. When we cough and sneeze, yet we produce more. The droplets that we produce, so this is just in our normal daily lives, um, uh, with or without this infection, we're producing these, these, these droplets. Um, but if, they, if you're infected with uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, the virus is in these respiratory secretions, or is in these droplets, can be in these small particles. So the droplets can spread within generally about six feet of, of another person. And that's why people have heard about in the lay press and, and maybe at your doctor's office staying, keeping six foot social distance. Because that's the approximate range where most droplets, because of gravity, will fall to the ground. Now, some people, uh, or people also produce smaller particles that in some people, these are produced in large quantities, can remain in the air beyond six feet. But we think most, most, the vast majority of this infection are spread within six feet from these respiratory droplets. The virus could also potentially be spread on surfaces, like a restaurant menu, uh, thinking of restaurants, um, or let's say in a, a bathroom somewhere. It doesn't live that long, several hours uh, uh, on those surfaces, um, but we still think most of the transmission is from these large droplets. So when, when people are thinking about their activities and their risk and how to reduce risk, they should think about, well, do, do, do the people around you have a mask on? And that's called source control. You're controlling the source of those droplets by having a mask that covers your nose and your mouth. Uh, that's something I learned about in public health school 40 years ago. And um, that's really important so that if somebody is infected and they're coughing, the cough, those particles, those droplets in particular are gonna be caught up in the mask and not hit you if you're sitting at the dinner table, for example, with them. So making sure that, that when you have a mask on, you're not only protecting yourself to some extent, you're really protecting those around you. Um, so, so number one, if you're going out masking to protect yourself, but to protect everybody around you. The risk also has to do with how much time you're exposed to somebody else. So, you know, obviously in a restaurant setting, as you, as you alluded to the potential for, for going out and dining, um, you know, if you're out with somebody for, for an hour or two, and if that person was infected, your risk is greater than if it was just transient two or three minutes of passing by and, and, and you know, uh, uh, not having much close contact. So time of exposure is important. Are people masked or not? Um, um, is the surface around you being cleaned properly? And um, back to, again, back to dining, 
um, are you inside or outside? And that has to do with the number of air exchanges. And so in hospitals and healthcare settings, we have very strict rules in terms of how much fresh air is coming to a room and how often the air is turned over within that room. There's a le lesser uh, requirements in non-healthcare settings, such as a restaurant or your home, where there may be very few air changes. So if you're sitting in a restaurant for an hour and a half, let's say, eating with somebody, uh, and the masks are off when you're eating, and I'll come back to that in a moment, um, and there's very little air exchange, you know, that's, you know, potentially, you know, potentially uh, 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 risky. So um, um, time is important. Is there source control? What's happening with the air and cleaning of, of the environment? But I want to come back to eating and drinking because when you're eating and drinking, you've removed the source control. You're taking your mask off, and others at the let's say table with you have their masks off to eat and drink, and that's a particularly unique risk, I believe, in terms of transmission. Um, and so, if you can keep socially distanced when eating and drinking and going outside, and um, where your 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 guard is down, literally, the mask is off you; it's off the person you're with or the people you're with. Um, and, and there, it's, the, the social distancing is particularly critical. Uh, so those large droplets, if somebody was unknowingly infected, happens to, is, is talking, breathing, might sing a song, uh, you, you want to prevent some of those particles from, 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 from getting to you. Does that make some, some sense? It makes all kinds of sense. Uh, and it certainly is the message we've been hearing from uh, Governor Raimondo here. Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott here, and, and of course, many people at Lifespan from Tim Babineau, the CEO and president on down. So it absolutely makes sense. Talk a little bit about uh, two particular areas that the governor has stressed recently, and recently is the last two or three weeks. And one of those is beaches. Uh, she recently, actually just today as we're taping this, reduced parking to 25% of capacity at two of the state beaches. She also has been very concerned about bars. And we've seen the experience in, in states like Texas and Arizona or California to an yeah. extent, Florida, where bars reopened for a while and those really became hotspots. So just yeah. give us yeah. an overview of those sure. two sure. possibilities. Sure. Yeah, thanks Wayne. Let me start with the bars and my heart does go out. I mean, one of my closest childhood friends is actually in California, owns a restaurant so to, you know, for restaurants and bars. You know, I realize to make a living, it's, it, it's tough. But bars are, I, I believe, a particular vulnerability. So you have a large number of people or a moderate number of people in a confined space. They're drinking, so their masks are off. You, you've now done away with source control. So if, and, and the problem with COVID, unlike many other infections, is people can transmit, particularly prior to their symptom onset. So you can feel okay one or two days before you actually become ill and be highly transmissible. Go to a bar, your mask, you, you've taken away the source control. They could be screened at the door. They have no symptoms. You've removed source control. Everybody's removed source control. We don't know what the air turnover is, but the requirements, I assume, in a bar isn't the same as a hospital. So maybe very little air turnover. You have lots of people jammed in there, and that's, a, in my mind, a very high-risk situation. So that, um, I, I think, is, is with all, you know, my heart, again, heart goes out to economically to people who own bars. I think it's very high risk because you've removed the masks. Um, one thing to think about, it's a little avant-garde, but um, face shields, um, do catch some of the droplets. And there's variability from face shield to face shield. Uh, there's actually a, a neat website in France that, that does smoke, they, they do some interesting testing visually with the ability to contain these droplets with different types of face shields. So now if you had a face shield that contained a fair amount of the droplets, it's possible, I'm being a little bit, again, avant-garde here, but it would be an extra layer of protection. You take your mask off, but if you had a face shield on uh, and you were able to put a straw under that, um, that might add actually, in my mind, an extra layer of protection in a situation such as a bar. Uh, is it possible you could eat a meal at a restaurant with a face shield on? It, it's, it's, 
possible with some face shields, but in a bar certainly to drink something if you had a straw, um, that that may uh, mitigate some risk. But bars are 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 very concerning uh, to me, and also unfortunately, I mean they're younger people that. Yeah, we know uh, in terms of just uh, development of executive function in the brain um, occurs at different rates uh, in younger people than, than it, you know, and uh, different genders. And, uh, you know, a, a young 18-year-old guy uh, may think they're going to live forever and it's not a risk, but they, they may be forgetting they're going to go home and see their mom and dad and grandparents and infect them and could cause, you know, a bad outcome. So bars are, are concerning. The beaches... Um, what I like about that is you're outside, it's often wind blowing, uh, uh, so you have you know, dilution as part of the solution of these respiratory particles in the air, you know, at the beach. Um, I think if people, you know, going through these phases, if people are vigilant, uh, like going to the beach, if they're appropriately socially distanced and that they go, let's say, to a place to get a meal, uh, they have their mask on, they do hand hygiene, the environment is cleaned. Uh, um, I think the risks are relatively low. The problem is people go out to the beach or you see some pictures where people are on their boats and everyone's together or on the sand and large groups together and they're unmasked and that's going to be risky. So I think there are ways to do it. I think the governor's move to reduce parking is what I had heard in, 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 in a couple of the beaches to reduce the density of people it's still concerning because if you have, let's say, only a quarter of the parking space is filled, but if those people going are all going to hang out, you know, they're not going to social distance and they're not going to mask, that's going to be a risk for those individuals. So I think going to the beach, if you socially distance um, or, or again, uh, keeping your mask on in, in, in groups, um, that's okay. But it, it, it's the behavior that people may have in those situations that's going to, you know, create a potential risk. What do you foresee for the next several weeks? And realizing, of course, that, that projections are an inexact science by definition because it, they rely in, in, to some extent on human behavior, which cannot be entirely controlled or in some instances controlled at all. But what do you foresee in the next few weeks in Rhode Island? And then if you want to give also a national uh, uh, view as well, we, sure. would, we would appreciate that. Sure. Of course, if I could predict the future, I'd tell people with certainty I you would have moved to Vegas. Uh, but uh, so uh, with that caveat, I think um, what's good about Rhode Island and, and many parts of the Northeast at the moment is we're at a very uh, low level of, of activity uh, with COVID-19, such that if we have a surge in the fall, um, um, we're starting at a much lower prevalence, and, 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 and I think with our experience, I, certainly at the hospital level, and I think at the community level with the health department and the governor's office, I, I think we're in as good a shape as we can be in Rhode Island to be able to manage what, what may come. Now, you know, um, historically, um, we know with just about every flu pandemic in relatively modern history in the last 150 years or so, there's been a second wave. And, and the timing of those are somewhat unpredictable. They've occurred at different times of the year. Um, but um, um, the uncertainty about school and some issues regarding going back, opening businesses back up, where there's gonna be, again, congregation of groups of individuals that increases the risk somewhat. Um, uh, I, you know, there is concern, I think, amongst public health professionals um, about uh, a second wave, you know, possibly in the fall. Again, no one knows, no, no one knows for sure. What, um, and, and we know from flu, this is not flu, it's COVID, but, it, but, but there are a lot of similarities um, um, that that's a concern. The school issue, and I, you know, I can go into more detail if you'd like, but you know, what's different, interestingly, about flu and COVID is flu transmission, uh, you know, we often think of kids getting the flu and transmitting to, to older, you know, uh, individuals, say, in, in their families, um, you know, as being a source of a lot of transmission in communities. In COVID, it may be different. 
uh, and that may be a different. So, so what's going to happen with schools? We may get a signal actually from some of the southern hemisphere that may be opening up schools and see what's happening there. It's unclear to me what the impact of school is going to be if, if we open schools per se. But I think if we have a second wave, I, I think in Rhode Island and some of the other uh, states, because we're at a very low level and because of our experience in doing it right the first time, I think we were ahead of the curve in many issues in terms of universal masking and such, I, I think we're in pretty good shape. There are forces, however, that are out of our control. We, people may know and remember, our N95 respirators, which we use in certain situations in the hospital setting to reduce risk of aerosol transmission. Uh, we had a pretty big stockpile, uh, the state health department did, but it was actually controlled by the CDC. So the feds actually came in and flew out with a large part of our stockpile and gave it to New York. And that was reasonable at the time. I, you'd have to check with our public health officials. I don't think that that's been backfilled to the level that we had had before. So there are certain, we have, um, you know, there were shortages of masks, N95 respirators, what we use to clean our hands, even what we use to clean surfaces in hospitals. And so there are constraints that will affect us in Rhode Island that are beyond our control. Uh, in terms of, you know, the supply chain, basically. And that's something we're very mindful of in, in lifespan. I think most uh, places like us are on the ball in terms of, in, in that regard, what's, what's their stockpile, what, what's their surge capacity. I think um, in other states that are in bad shape, what to portend for them, um, my guess is, you know, is it's going to keep going. I mean, uh, you know, I, I had heard on, on, on NPR driving home yesterday, the governor, I believe, is of Oklahoma is infected, who felt uh, we don't want to be a mask wearing state or made some apparently public statements in that regard. I think where there's a lack of leadership, unlike Rhode Island, uh, where there's a, and if those people are still in office and still don't believe in the science, I think it's going to keep spreading in those areas. And, now, and then I, what, what does that create in terms of risk for us in Rhode Island? Well, if one of those families is saying, where's a safe place for us to take vacation? Well, let's go to New England. They don't have many cases. And so that is a potential problem with people coming from these hotspots to Rhode Island. And however, is the governor's office, the public health department said, well, they, they need to quarantine. And if they're compliant with quarantining, then I think we're, you know, we're okay. But if they're not, that's a potential risk of incursions of potentially infected individuals unknowingly coming to our state and, um, you know, potentially uh, uh, transmitting. So I think in Rhode Island, so in some, I may think in Rhode Island, I think we're in good shape. If there's a second wave, we're in as good a shape as any state in the country. I, I think better than most, frankly. Um, I think there's gonna be other states that are continue, that are going to continue to have spread. And God forbid, if things get worse in the fall, the fall's gonna be very complicated by flu and respiratory syncytial virus and metanumovirus as a whole, the common cold virus, there's a lot of viruses that are going to start being transmitted more in the fall that's going to cause a lot of confusion of what do we do? Is it COVID? Is it the flu? And boy, if, if you're sitting now in Texas or Florida um, in one of these areas that are being hit hard now, I don't know, it, it, they're going to be uh, in a difficult situation when the other respiratory viruses, respiratory virus season starts and uh, um, in terms of personal protective equipment needs and such and testing and who to isolate and not to isolate, it's, they're going to be in rough shape. I'm, I'm optimistic for us in Rhode Island in that regard. I know personally, Dr. Alexander Scott, it's a moment in history, really, that's fortuitous. She, we have someone, she's trained in adult medicine, she's trained in pediatrics, she's trained in general pediatrics and medicine and in infectious diseases. She's a very bright, uh, thoughtful individual. And she's at the right place at the right time in history. I don't know the governor personally. I know of her background. She's highly intelligent. She asks the right questions. She supports, you know, there's a very good relationship with the public health department. So I think we're in great shape, as you alluded to earlier. I just want to reemphasize because of the great leadership that we have at the helm that's steering us in the right direction. And we have very good interactions myself personally with the health department and colleagues like, like myself where they're rendering the opinion of those of us in the trenches to work together as a system, as a state, to get us to where we need to go. So I think it, it, a lot of it comes down to leadership. Before I shut off the recorder, stay safe, keep up the great work. Um, we all appreciate it. It's been a privilege and thank you for the time.